Uh, Chris Janis has a background in international relations and political theory. He was an options trader at the Chicago Board Options Exchange where he traded his own account. Currently, he is a history teacher at the University of Chicago Laboratory School where he teaches advanced placement courses in modern European history and micro and macro economics. Today he will be talking to us about best practices for teaching these things and the title of his talk is Teaching Economics and Trying to Step Outside the Bubble of Capitalism. Please join me in welcoming Chris Janis. Hello. Um, Jamie asked me uh, in the spring to come talk about um, my economics class and in the process of doing so also to talk about the economic crisis, you know, how I saw it. And so we're going to do essentially four things today. I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching economics. I'm going to suggest to you that um, when there is a crisis at hand, when you want to understand an event in history, it's a good idea to have some sort of a perspective, a lens, a kaleidoscope through which to look at that crisis to make sense of it. I'm also going to argue that the, Paul, the uh, Simon Johnson piece that I hope that you've had a chance to look at um, is an interesting way, his argument is an interesting one when looking at this crisis trying to make sense of it. And then after a break, um, uh, one of my students, Lauren Cole, is going to talk about some student uh, research papers that uh, emerged because I was, at the, I was going to speak at this conference. This needs a little explanation. Uh, shortly after I agreed to speak, uh, several of those students came up to me and asked if they could do an extra credit assignment at the end of the year. And I suggested that they somehow participate in this conference. And then, somewhat to my surprise, four other students came up to me. They had heard that two students were somehow going to be involved in what I was doing, and they also wanted to be involved. So now I had six students. And Jamie wanted me to sort of explain, you know, how this occurred. You know, I can talk about that. What surprised me and what continues to surprise me about the students at lab is that they have this extra gear. I remember as a student, I would never have wanted to write another research paper at the end of the year in the midst of finals, AP exams, SAT twos. And so to some degree, whenever this happens at lab, when students sort of go that extra mile, it's all a bit of a miracle you know, for me, because I never would have done that as a student. Um, so Lauren and I sat down and said, how are we going to work this? And um, I decided I'd t talk about the course, so she may have some few things to say about it, and talk about the importance of the lens, briefly describe what I thought was the argument that Simon Johnson was presenting. Uh, but then each one of the students would take an aspect of the crisis whether it's banking, uh, the Obama's policy towards the Chrysler and GM executive compensation, and that they would write a research paper to try to determine whether Johnson's argument about how the administration was handling the crisis held up. So after the break, Lauren, who also wrote a paper, but also agreed to be the presenter, is going to talk a little bit about the student papers, you know, what she saw in them, and what her conclusions are. And no doubt you can add your piece as well. Um, so, by the way, I, I rarely talk to people like this, so it's a bit of a, an adventure for me. The original course that I taught at lab um, with another member of the department was not an advanced placement course. It was sort of a practical pig business course. And the idea was that students at lab, when they go out in the world, don't have a lot of practical business experience. Um, and so we thought, well, let's teach them how to grocery shop. Uh, let's teach them how to buy a car, rent an apartment, the difference between credit and debit. 
Um, and another member of the department who made a tremendous amount of money in real estate and was a very sort of practical person taught that part of the course. I taught the markets part of the course. Um, and the reason I was interested in markets, as Jamie suggested, I was an options trader before the lab school hired me. I'm not exactly sure why, in fact, they did hire me. Uh, I think the principal at the time liked people with unusual backgrounds. Um, in any event, I was interested in markets. And it's worth talking a little bit about me as an options trader because I think in a way it's relevant to the crisis at hand and relevant to the kinds of ideas that you could talk to your students about whether you're teaching an economics class or not. What I discovered as this crisis unfolded is that I made the same mistakes that these financial titans made. However, I was a novice trader and can somehow forgive myself for making those mistakes. And, but it's a lot more difficult for me to understand how CEOs, how chief traders at these big firms could make the same damn mistakes. Um, initially, I was lured to the options pit because I had a friend, Jerry Solar, who was a big trader in IBM, IBM options. And he wanted to expand his business, and he wanted someone to create positions off the floor. And so I interviewed a firm that would be supervising me creating these positions. He thought I'd be good at it. And they said, no, we don't want you. And we don't want you because you have no floor experience. You're absolutely a novice to this business, too dangerous. By then, I was kind of interested in the business, so I decided I would buy my own seat and go down there and trade. Not a good idea. Uh, trading is a little bit different than most jobs because in most jobs you get paid a salary or a commission. If you're not working very hard and you're on commission, of course, you'll make less money. But you don't, it's not a situation where at the end of the day you can lose money. And you really need to have some sort of a mentor uh, to guide you past some of the freshman mistakes you might make as a trader. I did not have such a mentor. My relationship with Jerry sort of soured after that. So I was down there on my own. Um, one of the things I did that I think is part of this crisis that you can talk to your kids about is that instead of focusing on risk management, I focused on profit. How much money was I going to make today? How much money was I going to make this month? And that was the wrong emphasis. Risk, managing risk is much more important when you're trading markets than managing profit. And people don't see that when they're introduced to markets. Another mistake I made uh, was that my positions were too big. Size kills. And this certainly, I think, is part of what has happened today. Banks took on positions that were way too large for them. And that's fine when the market goes your way, but when the market doesn't go your way and it's difficult to get out of the market, size can take you out of the game. Uh, so my positions were too big. The third mistake I made was that they were too highly leveraged, uh, which means, of course, if the market goes your way again, you make a lot of money, but when the market doesn't go your way, uh, it can be a disaster. And the last mistake I made was that as an options trader, you take on a lot of different positions during the day. You're one of those people in the pit screaming and yelling. And people, people come in, you buy and sell options throughout the course of the day. And at the end of the day, you have this mass of different positions that using a computer, you get some sense of what would happen to those positions if the market moved, if the stock moved or the market moved. But things can change, and that might be imprecise. The other difficulty with a mass complicated position is that it's difficult to adjust even if you know what you have to do. You know, you might not be able to reach for you know, the right set of options to, to make yourself neutral again. Now, what happened, I think, in this financial crisis, oftentimes there weren't really even markets that were traded. And so it was very difficult to determine the value of the positions these folks had on. So they had positions on that were not transparent, very difficult to understand positions that were way too large for them, positions that were way too leveraged, and where they were focusing on profit and not risk management. And as I say, I was stunned that they would make the same mistakes that I did. So in, in one way, this crisis 
you know, I think human beings make the same mistakes, these same mistakes over and over and over again. Um, in this original course, when I talk to students about markets, I had two very different approaches. And again, I think this is practical, this is kind of conversation could come up in a class that wasn't economics. One is, you know, most of your students will invest at one point or another, retirement accounts, maybe, you know, small stock account. And the best way to do that for the majority of us is to invest in index funds, no load index funds, and not managed accounts. I'll give you an example of why that's the case. And this is from uh, Charlie Whelan's book, Naked Economics. He suggested that if you put $10,000 in the average managed account, um, by, 19, by 2003, I think when this book was published, you would have made $171,000. If you had taken that same $10,000 and put it in the S&P 500 index fund, a no-load fund, you would have made $311,000. Two reasons for that. One is only about 20% of managed funds can beat the S&P over a 20-year period. So, you know, having a guiding hand at the pillar doesn't make any sense. Secondly, those managed accounts cost a lot more. The fees are much higher. So for the majority of your students, if they ask, well, how do I make money in the stock market? The answer is no load index funds. You invest on a monthly, quarterly basis, and don't go the managed route. Don't take tips. Don't follow your broker's advice. Just put your money in index funds. The other advice I had for them in that class, which was actually quite different and almost the opposite, was those students who have a gift for markets and are willing to do the sweat equity, the homework, they should follow Peter Lynch's approach, who used to be the um, sort of the manager of the Magellan Fund at Fidelity and was very successful. And his argument was do your homework first and pick stocks that are small to medium size that you can really analyze that are not hot stocks. Um, and have a story about why you think that stock is going to go up. And then once you have your story in place to hold that stock, if the stock goes down, buy more because your story's there. The reason for you investing in that stock still holds true. If the stock goes up 50% and the story is true, don't sell it. So um, you you have a strong rationale as to why you picked that stock. You picked a stock where you know the management, you know the product, and the way you make money in the market is to let those few stocks that are really winners run 20, 30 times the value that you initially invested in. So for those students that actually have a feel for markets and are interested in stocks, Peter Lynch is a great model. And for the rest of us, and I would include myself in the rest of us, um, no load index funds is the way to go. So I think that's useful advice outside, outside of an economics class. Um, at some point in the mid-90s, this guy came to the lab school and he said, I've been teaching AP economics for 25 years. I've won several prizes doing it. Could I teach such a course at the lab school? And I was in, involved in this meeting because of this practical economics class. I think my department chair and the principal realized that if this course was taught, if this guy was teaching the course in economics, I wouldn't be teaching the practical business course anymore because students wouldn't sign up for it. Politics got in the way. The guy was never offered a job. But I thought to myself at the time, boy, that's a really good idea. Um, economics, to me, is the most valuable of any of these social sciences for understanding the world. And at the University of Chicago, where they have a very famous uh, economics department, a great business school, it was almost a travesty to me that advanced placement course was not being taught. So I decided that I would, you know, write up a proposal, put it in the uh, course uh, description book, and a lot of people signed up for it. So now I was teaching micro and macroeconomics. And the first thing, that it, first thing I had to do is, of course, choose what text to use. And what I discovered is, I, mean, I sat down that summer and looked at a number of college textbooks, and I discovered is they were deadly dull. 
And while those people who are really interested in economics would probably, you know, wade through it, um, it would not have broad appeal. I finally found a text by David Colander, which is not widely used. He teaches economics at Middlebury, but he's funny. Um, he tells a lot of stories about himself. I remember early in the book he said, you know, one of his girlfriends left him because he was too damn reasonable. All is weighing the costs and benefits of every decision, you know, every decision that they made as a couple, and she just got sick and tired of his reasonableness. Um, but that kind of personal touch and sort of quirky character, I think, is more interesting for students. So if you teach a course in economics, try to find something that is readable, that students will actually like reading. A little bit later on, I also stumbled across another book, which uh, a former student told me is, was at the time used at Harvard um, by a guy named Charlie Whelan called Naked Economics. He actually teaches at the Harris School over here. Um, and basically, it is the introductory course without the math and the graph. And some students are turned away from economics because they're uncomfortable with math. So this was sort of a, a way to have those students be able to look at the concepts, look at the ideas in economics without having to worry about the math. And it's a great supplement. Um, A couple of examples. Um, it's exhausting talking this much. Uh, early in his uh, book, he asked the question, and he's not the first person to ask it, who feeds Paris? What's the answer to that? Hmm? Uh, to some degree, the world feeds Paris. Not a bad answer. Anyone else? Uh, to some degree, the rest of France feed Paris. That's certainly true. Anyone else? The what? Agribusiness corporations. Um, that's true, too. None of these answers have been wrong. Well, uh, the answer is the invisible hand or the forces of supply and demand or you know, people demanding things and other people recognizing that they demand things. And if you demand something in economics, you have to be able to pay for it. If you want to drive a Porsche, if you demand a Porsche, you've got to have the money to buy a Porsche. So people demanding things and other people recognizing those demands and being willing to supply them. So it really is the market or the forces of supply and demand or the invisible hand that feeds Paris. And Whelan writes a couple of beautiful paragraphs about that. And then he says, of course, well, the alternative would be some kind of a central authority. And a central authority would never be able to do this um, with the productivity that the market can. So it's just an example of the power of markets. Um, another nice thing about free markets is that everyone is pursuing their own self-interest or maximizing their utility. But then, let's say, for example, let's pick on women. Some young girl decides that she wants to spend a great deal of money uh, for a birthday cake for her dog instead of giving that money to the poor. How do you guys feel about that? It's a good idea. Oh, why? Why is that? Why not? All right. Give the baker. Uh, that's a pretty good answer. And why not is pretty good as well. Makes her feel good. Uh, anyone object to that? Well, that was my initial reaction. That stupid, frivolous girl. People are in need, and she's spending money on a birthday cake for a dog, and the dog probably won't even like it. Um, we only suggest, however, that you got to let her do it. And you got to let her do it, um, because if you don't let her do it, then you're going to have to oppress her. 
And no system of oppression is as good as letting the free market, you know, run on its own. And I like that story because I'm not so sure that I'm naturally tolerant. I have very strong opinions about things. I'm quick to judge other people. But I also remember the doggy birthday cake. It makes sense. It's a good idea, Chris, to let her buy that cake. Because as Whelan says later on in the book, I don't rule the world. So there's a wonderful tolerance to markets, um, which I like. Keeps me mellow. Um, the most important, I think, part of any good class is student inquiry. And um, these, uh, these students willing to volunteer to help me participate uh, is, makes me break even on this talk already, even if you don't like it. I've broken even uh, because this has provided an opportunity for the students to take charge of their own looting and participate. The other thing I do uh, in economics that I think is pretty important is that I let students um, lead discussions. And I, to all degree, to some degree, did this, but there is a formal program that I would recommend to you at Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, um, and there's the uh, URL there, called the Exeter Harkness Method. And essentially what it is is that students run the class, the teacher sits there, doesn't say anything. And then at the very end of the class, you know, the teacher may have a comment or two, but there are some forms that uh, determine who interacted with whom. But essentially, it's allowing the students to run the class. And I do that in economics. They lead the discussions. Uh, I do jump in. I don't sit there silently. I do jump in. But there are several advantages to that. One is they're learning more actively than if I was talking to them. Um, the other is that you don't have to talk as much. Um, and the third, third is you get to know your students pretty well. I mean, if you do all the talking, who are those folks out there? How, are they capable, not capable? And what you discover is that some of them aren't particularly good teachers. Some of them are certainly as good as you are, and some of them are significantly better. Um, so it's a useful method, and I would highly recommend, I think that's two weeks. Exeter's a beautiful campus if you haven't been to it. I would recommend that to you. Another, I think, important thing about economics, and this can be applied in any class, is, and this is particularly true for microeconomics, uh, which I teach first. I think in many high schools they only teach macro, you know, about the entire economy, um, or they teach that first and macro later. I teach the micro first because it focuses more on how people make decisions. And this has broad uh, relevance. You know, essentially in economics, you weigh the costs and the benefits. Any decision you make, you got to sit down and say, do the benefits outweigh the cost, and then you do it, or vice versa. Um, and the other thing that you realize is that whatever decision you make, there is a benefit foregone, or there is a cost. For example, if you weren't at this conference, where would you be? You. 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 Oh, you teach. At the beach. At the beach. All right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, so you think the benefits of being here outweigh being at the beach? Okay. <laughs> um, I hope you're right. Um, but that's, that's an important realization. I think a lot of young people, you know, they, they make choices, but they don't think about the cost of making those choices, the benefit that they might have derived if they had done something else. And that comes back to this other idea, which I think is very important um, for young people and for adults as well. There isn't any free lunch. There is always a cost, no matter what you do. And I think a lot of us, when we make decisions, really don't think that through. Um, so that sort of reasoning, um, to me, is one of, the, one of the key reasons that economics is valuable, decision-making. 
Another thing that I, that I try to do quite a bit of is I have outside lecturers come in. It's real easy at the University of Chicago, um, you know, members of the econ department, members of the business school, parents that are in business. It's so easy to find people that can add value to the, to the class. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, have any of you read Freakonomics? Steve Levitt. Uh, he is in the e econ department here. He has come in, not recently, but he has come into my class several times. And um, he's an unusual guy, I think. He's an excellent teacher. Some, some of the lecturers are not particularly good teachers. Um, they do too much lecturing. But he walked into the class and just immediately was like it was his class. I don't know how he did it, but he's an unusual person. And I remember a number of years ago, he came in and he talked about uh, one of the stories in Freakonomics this, about this guy, uh, Paul Feldman, who was a trained economist, I think at MIT, and was doing some security analysis in Washington, D.C. Um, and the point of the story in the book is this guy started a little business where he would, he would sell bagels first of all to the people under him, and then to different corporations in the D.C. area. So he would supply bagels, and there would be a little box, and people would put their money in, and they'd take the bagel. And Levitt found this interesting because uh, he didn't think there was that, he doesn't think there's that much known about white-collar crime. And what he discovered from analyzing this bagel business is, is that about 87% of the people are honest. Adam Smith thought, most of the human beings were honest. Socrates thought most human beings were honest. And so this little business of Paul Feldman basically confirmed that. So he discovered that in holidays, people are less honest. That after September 11th, people were a little bit more honest. That the higher up you were in the corporation, the, more, the less likely you were to be honest. Uh, Levitt wondered whether that's because as you go up the corporation, if you're, good at, if you're good at going up the corporation, you're a good cheater. I don't know. When he came in, however, to talk to the econ class, he put a different spin on the story, which I actually found more interesting. He argues that Feldman knew to the, to the last bagel how many bagels he needed to supply. He was very, kept very careful records of the business. So on the supply side, he was extremely well informed. However, he never experimented with the price of the bagels. And Steve, who consults for a lot of different businesses, said that that's pretty common, that you're, you're in a business and you don't experiment with price. And there's a problem with that. You've got a demand curve there. And there's this concept in economics which I think has broad relevance. It's called elasticity. How do you respond to changes in prices? That's essentially what that means. And in the middle of that curve, elasticity one, it's unit elastic. There's no change. Above ED1, that's the elastic part of the demand curve. That is to say, people are very responsive to price changes. And below one, that's the inelastic part of the demand curve. People are not as responsive to prices. And this brings up the whole idea of substitution. You tend to be more elastic when you can substitute another product. If there aren't a lot of substitutes, then you tend to be on the inelastic part of the demand curve. Now, let's get back to the story. Um, hmm. Just a sec. Very strange. Um, okay, good. This is the inelastic part of the demand curve. Now let's say that Feldman's, the price for the Feldman bagel uh, was $1. And he had never experimented with raising the price. Would that have been a smart idea? Why not? Well, let's say he moved it to two dollars. Would he have made more money looking at that graph, do you think? Yes. 
Yeah, he would have. You would have lost B because one person would have substituted, okay? You would have sold eight bagels as opposed to nine. So one person says, I ain't eating a bagel today. He's doubled the price. I'm going to have a donut. But the other eight people would have continued to buy the bagel. So his total revenue would have increased by $16, uh, and he would have lost nine. So I, I guess Levitt's point to Feldman, who was a friend of his, look, you could be on the inelastic part of the demand curve, and you haven't experimented with price. That's crazy. However, Oh, okay, that's odd. I've, the graph is not supposed to, I mean, it's supposed to be there. That sort of emerges. Um, now, let's say Feldman was charging $8 for a bagel, and he decided to charge 9 Would that have been a smart idea? Why not? You. Yes. You, you gain C, and what do you lose? Precisely. So under those conditions, of course, uh, Feldman, that would have been a bad idea to raise price. But Levitt's point was that here you had a trained economist uh, who knew supply, he was a very careful person, very successful business, who had never, did not know where he was on uh, the demand curve in terms of elasticity. Very odd. And I think the relevance of that is that, for example, let's say you love shoes. And the shoes you normally buy are $200. Let's say they go up $25. Are you going to continue to buy those shoes, or would you substitute? So you can get students thinking about, you know, where am I on the demand curve for this pair of shoes? If you're on the elastic part of the demand curve, you would substitute. You wouldn't pay the extra 25 bucks for those shoes. If you're on the inelastic part of the demand curve, you say, hey, I really like those shoes. Well, I'll buy them anyway. And of course, the person, the maker of those shoes is going to make more money, more total revenue as a result of that. Yeah. Now, one little trick with that, of course, is that let's say you're on the inelastic part of the demand curve and you raise your price. Short term, people will continue to buy your shoes. But then maybe long term, they say, you know, those shoes have gotten pretty expensive and they find a substitute. And you know, part of, I think, Paul Feldman's concern was that short term he might be able to get away with it, but long term he would lose customers. But it's strange that, you know, if you're in business, you've got to play with price, I think. Um, I'm running out of time, but one nice thing about teaching this class is that, you know, some students are very verbal, good with words, and, you know, they can read a paragraph and, you know, look at a problem just verbally. But then there's some students that are much more comfortable uh, using graphs, seeing something visually. And some graphs in economics just speak to you, and they're much more effective than words. Um, let me give you a couple examples. This is, um, if you look at those two curves there, the Pakistan curve and the Belgium curve, those are how much Pakistan can produce in, ter uh, in terms of textiles and chocolate absent trade. If the Pakistanis themselves just produce textiles and chocolate, they can produce 4,000 yards of textiles and one ton of chocolate. The Belgians, however, can produce four tons of chocolate and 1,000 yards of textile. So if there's no trading going on, those, are, those curves represent the productivity of those two countries. However, let's say um, the countries specialize and they trade with each other, and each country does what they do best. So the Pakistanis would clearly do what? Textiles. And the Belgians clearly would produce chocolate. Now, what then happens, instead of those two productivity lines, you have a new productivity line that, it, that is clearly much more productive, much further out there. Much more can be produced when people specialize. So you just look at this one image and you say, 
This is why economists love trade. This is why economists love specialization. Because so much more can be produced. So it's like a picture tells a thousand words or whatever it is. This is a very sophisticated machine that does... <coughs> the Phillips curve is another interesting graphical rep representation for me. <coughs> you hear a lot in the news about unemployment and inflation, right? And sometimes you hear economists or business people talking about the relationship between them. Typically, um, when there's a lot of inflation, it means the economy is booming, uh, is close to potential output, in which case there's not going to be that much unemployment. However, in a recession like we're in now, we don't have any inflation, very little pressure on prices. In fact, there's some deflation, um, but we have high unemployment. So when you look at this graph, you see an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. Very powerful relationship, um, very influential up to the 70s, um, and still relevant. What's also interesting about this curve, though, is that we've had two decades when it hasn't really worked, and the exceptions are, in some sense, more interesting than the relationship itself. In the 70s, what do we have? That's right. Uh, we had stagflation. We were in a recession with high inflation. Why? Well, the answer was that you had, you, you had a, a, a tremendous uh, spike in oil prices in 73, 79, and people began to expect inflation. So expected inflation and in the spike in oil prices led to a new situation where economists and the government really didn't know what to do. You can deal with inflation or unemployment, but how do you deal with both? Well, they decided that inflation was more pernicious than unemployment, and therefore they raised interest rates to try to get inflation out of the system, but we had tremendous unemployment. Conversely, in the 90s, what did we have? Low unemployment, low inflation. Perplexed the hell out of Alan Greenspan. And, I mean, how uh, can... Um, can we have low, we understood uh, low, low unemployment because the economy was booming, but why no inflation? And his answer was increases in productivity. But we've had two very interesting decades where this relationship hasn't worked. So it's a really interesting curve and it's, I like it. Last example. Um, this is the Lorenz curve, and it illustrates the share, the share distribution of income among... I'm not nearly finished, of course. Have most of you looked at the student abstracts? Do you need a break? You probably desperately need a break. You do. Um, I'll talk for five more minutes. You're going to have to talk about the Johnson Oil. You're going to talk about it anyway, right? Okay. So we'll just get rid of some of my talk. Um, you keep track five minutes. Sorry. Um, this is an interesting curve. It reflects how much inequality, income inequality, we have in our system. And as you, as you look at this curve, you can see that between 1929 and 1970, America became a lot more equal. There was less income inequality. And then from 1970, um, really until the present, income inequality has increased in this country almost to the level of 1929. Now, this interests me for a couple of reasons. One is that income inequality is not a very popular topic within the capitalistic framework. Issues of fairness, income inequality 
always tend to get pushed to the sidelines, um, particularly since Ronald Reagan got into office with this idea of supply-side economics, tax cuts for the rich, it's going to increase productivity, never really worked. Um, but the other reason I think that this is relevant is because I think Obama and Larry Summers, the sort of chief economic advisor, are committed to having less income inequality. They believe that this country will be better off with less income inequality if the middle class and the poor get a leg up here. They think that this income inequality distribution has gone too far. So it's an interesting curve. This I thought was interesting. Uh, Jeffrey Mankiw, who teaches the introductory course at Harvard, wrote a little article. And he said, well, how will the freshman economics class change as a result of this crisis? And he had a couple of things in mind. One is that there will be more prominence in the introductory course in the financial system. Um, there isn't enough emphasis on the course right now. You know, we say it's a giant channeling device to turn savings into spending for every real transaction. There's a financial transaction that coordinates things within the economy, but then the course moves on. Can't do that anymore with the collapse of the financial system. The other thing he says is that we need to talk much more about leverage and the dangers of leverage. Really doesn't play a part in the standard economic textbook at all right now. Thirdly, uh, what happens when the first line of defense in a recession, monetary policy, the Federal Reserve making money cheaper and cheaper by cutting the Fed funds rate, the rate that banks charge each other overnight. What happens when that no longer is useful because the Fed funds rate is essentially at zero where it is now? What then do you do? Um, and so he feels that there needs to be a lot more discussion about what occurs then. And the last thing he said, which I think is interesting in this article, he said essentially fluctuations in the business cycle are, you can't predict them. And I think the, this crisis is a perfect example of this. I mean, I think most economists were caught flat-footed by the severity, at least, of this crisis. They did not predict this. They were surprised by it. And he argues that's always going to be the case like markets themselves, uh, the ability to predict where markets are going to go or fluctuations in the business cycle ain't going to happen. I have a minute. Okay. This is too long. Can't do that one. Um, one last thing I'll say. The importance of having a lens to look at a crisis like we well like we exist like exists now. One of my favorite books is a book by Thomas Kuhn called *The Structure of Scientific Revolutions*. It was written in 1962, and his basic argument is that in a revolutionary time period or a crisis, people become disoriented. And one of the, one of the lines that I like uh, is that ducks become rabbits. You look over there and you see a duck, and suddenly it turns into a rabbit. Uh, things are, are put on their heads. And so the way to get around that is to have some kind of a framework, some kind of a stance to look at a particular crisis. And the reason I like the Simon Johnson article, and this, Lauren pointed this out to me, I and mean, I felt this, she articulated it. So one of the great appeals of that article is that he said, I've seen this before. This has happened in emerging markets. What's happening in the United States is happening in emerging markets. This is not rocket science. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>